forgot that I was recording. I was ready to go do something with the plants. Have you ever uh, went and did something that you shouldn't have? You know, like, oh, I don't know, kind of thought that you should do something. You know, you've heard that expression. When you don't know what to do, do something. Well, I've heard that expression. Sometimes it's been used on me by pastors, by teachers, by people sharing the Word of God. And one day I decided to look it up. You know, strong recordings or, in my case, lately, instead of a strong, I use Google. <laughs> My favorite expression, Google it. One way or another, you're going to find out either what the Bible has to say, what all kinds of commentaries have to say, what all kinds of websites have to say, what all kinds of people have to say. But if you Google it, one way or another, you're going to hear something. <laughs> or you can, you know, of course, bing it, but it doesn't sound quite so interesting. Bing it. <laughs> uh, yeah, eh, eh, you know. You could have altivisted it, but, you know, those days are kind of going by the wayside. But I went ahead and Googled just do something and I found it wasn't in the Bible. Look a shock. Bing! The light came on. Just do it or just do something isn't godly. It's worldly. It's telling your flesh to go ahead and act without the direction of God. Because our lives, a lot of times, we act according to impulse or knee-jerk. You know, somebody says something to you and you slap them back immediately. Because after all, they offended you. And then they try to explain it to you and you slap them again. And they try to explain it to you and you slap them again. Matter of fact, you keep slapping them down until they quit trying to explain it to you. Ever done that? So, I learned, if God isn't telling you to do it, don't do it. You know, have your backup. No, not your backup, like, you know, your attitude, but have Him as your backup, your person who's covering your back, who's taking care of you, who's directing you and telling you what to do. Because it's very, very, very easy to get up in the morning and whew, out the door. I don't have time to ask God. I'm on my way. I'll ask him on the way. And by that time, you get hit by a car and die. Because he didn't want you to drive and find out. As a matter of fact, he didn't want you to get in the car in the first place. He kind of wanted you to spend some time with me first to find out what's going on. Here's the big picture. Here's the little picture. And here's your picture. Kind of like, uh, if you go out there, you're on your own. But, you know, I'd like you to find out what you're going into so you're prepared. That way, if you need me, I'll be there. But if you go without me, I think you're on your own and you're not really going to have my hand covering you like, you know, you believe in. Because <laughs> I've already said, hey, I'm over here. Stay here underneath this covering. You know, it's raining. Don't go out in the rain. And so you do and you get wet. It's kind of like that happens with knee-jerk responses. You know, people get confronted by something that hits them in the face. They go, bam! First reaction, you know, is the fight or flight. Only, that's not a true portrayal of a Christian. A true Christian, if they get hit, doesn't fight or flight. They turn the other cheek, don't they? Or do they? Oh, it's going to be one of those messages. No, it's not. I like to ask people a lot of times when they say something, do something, or somehow come across my path that God has brought them to me in some way, that my first question is, did God tell you to do that? Or sometimes it's not my first question. Sometimes I let them explain it to me first, you know, to see where their heart is at. Then when they, I know their heart is wrong, then I ask them, I say, well, did God tell you to do that? Because I know based upon their own responses, no, God didn't tell them to do that. They did it on their own. Because I've done that. <laughs> I don't have a problem identifying me in you. You see, what I really want to do is identify Jesus in you. I don't want to identify me in you because, believe me, I can see me in you every day. You know, I mean, 
I just go on the internet, man, I can see me all over the place, you know. Yeah, I know what that's like. There's that intellectual idiot, you know, trying to make something smart of himself. Oh, yeah, I know what that's like. I know how to argue those kind of things. Oh, yeah, I know what that is. That's kind of like, you know, theological, you know, fallacies being presented as though they were true. Oh, yeah, I know what that dogma is, you know. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah we've been there Messianic. Oh, yeah, we've been there Jew. Oh, yeah, we've been there Gentile. Oh, yeah, we've been there, you know. In other words, I can see me and you, you know. That's no problem. What I really want to see is Jesus in you. Because when I see Jesus in you, it wakes up Jesus in me. And then I'm kind of excited about it. It's like, man, the Jesus in you and the Jesus in me, it's like, man, we get completed together. You know, we kind of exhort each other and encourage each other. We're both lifted up. It's kind of neat that way. Unfortunately, <laughs> what I run into a lot of times is that I deal with people that want to somehow or are somehow intimidated by me or challenged by my relationship with God so that they want to tear or attack or somehow in some way put down me. What about me? They don't like me no more. And I feel lovable. I'm just a nice guy. Once you get to know me. They do. I mean, I... I have this Friday, you know, this, thank God, you know, end of a long, drawn-out year or two process that is freeing me up from a, a person that has been very bitter, you know, very, no matter what I wanted to do or got to do or prayed for, there's nothing to do. So, in the end, I said... If God doesn't tell me to do it, I'm not doing it. And so, at some point in time, we just recently finally are, we've been burned, you know, big time by this person. And I told my wife, I said, look, we're moving into a place of blessing. I said, you know, I'm going to bless that person. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray for their ministry. I'm going to pray for their, their church, their everything that they are, you know, that they, they, they say they are and they personify and they do. I don't care what they've done to me. I don't care how they act. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to walk away. And if God wants to do something, I'll watch and see what He does. Because I've watched too many times where God comes through. But my wife, unfortunately, you know, when we got sent this huge bill, you know, as though we had done something, you know, really devastating to this place we used to live, <laughs> you know, never mind that we cleaned it, you know, took care of it, you know, practically painted it. Um, shampooed it, did you know all kinds of extra things that nobody ever does, you know. And I told my wife before we left, I said, you know, based upon this, you know, circumstance, I said, don't expect money out of this. I said, you know, you're not going to get your deposit back. You're not going to get anything back out of this. I said, if anything, this is all a trial to see where your heart is at. If you'll be able to walk away from this situation with the grace and mercy of God and let God be your defense. And so, you know, she accepts what I say at the time, but then if I leave her alone, she goes and wants to give him a piece of her mind, you know. So, sure enough, I shared with my wife the other day, and I said, well, honey, I said, so are we finally closing the door on this debt, you know, on this payment, you know, so that we can finally just walk away from the old place, you know. And she said, yep. And I went, okay, that's not exactly the answer I was thinking for. Kind of like, you know, let's pray or let's, you know, bless them or something because I had said, you know, every step of the way we need to pray about this. So she said, yep. And I said, okay, so what are you going to do? I said, are you going to mail it to them, you know, or are you going to, you know, drop it off? She says, oh, no, I want to drop it off. I said, okay, so are you going to give them a piece of your mind? <laughs> it was like that should have been a big warning sign for her, you know. Excuse me, you're a Christian. You're going to give a piece of your mind? She says, well, I'm going to let them know. And I went, no, you're not. I said, we already talked about this. I said, no, you don't want to let them know. You want to work on you. You don't want to work on them. I said, you're the one with the bad attitude. I said, even if you're right and they're wrong, you let it go so that God can make you right rather than enforce what you think of your own righteous cause upon them who are unwilling to receive it. They will not agree with you. You will cause a big conflagration of 
peoples and attitudes and actions that are all in the flesh. So you're stirring the pot rather than walking away because they're expecting you to be upset. They're expecting you to be mad. They're expecting you not to pay what they claim you owe. So because we're paying it, we're investing our trust in the Lord to redeem our money back to us in ways that you might not see right off the bat, but believe me, God is going to bless this big time and hugely so because A, you're in the right, and B, they're in the wrong. And C, you're trying to take advantage of it. So you let it go. Let them have it. Let people do their thing and watch and see what the Lord will bring. It's kind of like the old idea that you give them enough rope, they'll hang themselves, but you don't jerk the rope. <laughs> and you let the rope out. You know, you don't go, here's some rope. Yeah. And you, you know, because if anything, they'll get choked and then they'll grab that rope and then throw you overboard with that rope, so to speak. So she kind of listened to me and went silent. <laughs> and every guy knows what the silent treatment means. You're mad, aren't you? No, I'm not. <laughs> okay, sure, you're not. <laughs> you know, the Lord told me you're mad, but we're not going to go there. So I said, well, I thought we were going to bless them, you know, like, you know, and blessing will leave them, you know, and kind of like, you know, we don't shake off the dust, you know, from them, but we just leave them with a blessing so that they, if God is using this to test us, we're learning from it. If he's using it to test them, they're learning from it. You know, we can leave this in God's hands because Christian to Christian, you should leave it alone and let it go because it's not that big a deal. You're going to spend eternity with these people, you know. So who cares? A little temporary setback financially? Eh, you know, that's the way it goes. So, praise the Lord. <laughs> We're still a few days away from, you know, completion, but I'm sure that, you know, based upon what I first said, you know, that she should mail it, all I have to follow up with her now is, will you also not mail a note with it? Because <laughs> I already know she'll write her two cents. Because my little feisty little woman, you know, she'd get mad, and if she'd get mad, God help you. Because she's really kind of mellow until she gets mad. And then all of a sudden, there's the flesh, just like you and I. So you see, we can all stand up for ourselves if we want to. We can all go and do what we want to do. And most of the time, I tell people, hey, go ahead, you, you, you run out there in that rain, you know. Me, I, I think I want to get an umbrella, you know, make sure that I'm kind of like, God, you want me to go out there? You know, oh, you don't? Okay. Yeah, that's right. The umbrella's got a hole in it. So, when I do what God wants me to do, I get blessed. When I do something without asking God, I get in a mess. You see, I either get blessed or mess. So, I kind of like this idea of blessed rather than run out there and make a mess. Because when he blesses me, I kind of enjoy it. But when he messes with me, I kind of go out there and i got a big learning lesson that, you know, I'm really stuck in the middle of this dump, dive, or whatever it may be, you know, kind of looking around going, what in the world and how did I get here? And God says, well, let me tell you what i got to say. Things that are pleasing in his sight, without faith it is impossible to please him. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Really? You mean I was fleshing out? Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are holy, you know, kind of like the one we read earlier, <laughs> that we talked about before. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. This is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, if, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. But, if a man for conscience for God endures grief, suffering wrongfully, then how right is it of him to endure that? Because, you see, for your conscience sake, so you don't have to, like, you know, kind of think, well, you know, they kind of bugged me, they kind of did this, you know, but since I turned it over to God, and I let it go, I can let God do what I know he's doing. Let go, let God, let Him know. Then you have no problem. Because the results are what you're after, right? I mean, isn't this true? What you really want to see is the results. Well, if you wait long enough, you'll see the results in this life. 
come upon any of your enemies or trials or tribulations or learning experiences or those things that you felt like you were wronged in, you'll see it in this life. God will bring it around if you're watching for it and if you're asking. But if your heart is wrong, then he'll bring it around to test your heart to see where you're coming from. If you have compassion and mercy upon a person. Or if you're thinking, gotcha. You're gonna, God's going to get you. You see, gotchas only get back a getcha. Because God's going to get you. So don't get a gotcha attitude about anything. Because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Not you will repay. Not I will take vengeance and show you what I'm going to do for you so that you can go, ha, 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 look at my enemies. Ha, they've been put down. No. It says, come to me and say, hey, God, just like David did, God, I'm righteous in this. I want you to kill them. I want you to dash their babies upon the ground. Wait a minute. David was talking about abortion? Ooh. How about that, all the abortion, anti-abortion people? David, the king, wanted to kill the children. Ooh. Oops. Sometimes, you know, you just don't want to get too caught up in social issues. Because if you really go back to the Bible, you find all kinds of things you don't want to know. David did want his enemy's kids to be smashed to pieces on the rocks. Sounds like abortion to me. Or pretty close. Now, I'm not saying David was right. He was a man after God's own heart. But he wanted his enemies killed? Children killed? Kind of frustrates the appearance of grace, doesn't it? Because, you see, when we share with God our heartfelt emotions, that doesn't mean God told us to do something with those emotions. It means that God could take those and make right the direction he wants us to go with our devotion. Because if we're devoted to him, then we can give him our emotion and then trust what he tells us to do after that. But if you take your emotion and you run out with it, you're liable to dash babies upon the rocks like David prayed. Or in this case, shared in Psalms. You're liable to say you have justification for it based upon Psalms itself, as well as a few other places in Scripture. But the reality of what Jesus said, you heard it has been written, but I say unto you. He isn't talking about what you can read. He's talking about what you can hear. And that means you have to have a personal relationship with God in order for God to speak to you what applies to you today. Otherwise, you're always going to be caught in an endless debate between what is written and what is written, not what is applied to you by the Spirit of God. Because as the Spirit of God to you. Then you have Jesus speaking literally what he wants you to do each day. And if you follow what he says, then you don't contradict scripture, you fulfill it. It's pretty simple. That's why you have religion and relationship in right perspective with God. Because if you go without God, you wind up with religion only and you start doing dogmatically these things that are written as opposed to doing those things that are contrary or complementary to Scripture, which is the balance of having a relationship that God will say, this applies to you and this doesn't apply to you. Frankly, Shabbat does not apply to you. <laughs> you're not living in Israel. <laughs> said, look, if you keep this, you know, and, you know, when you're in the land, and when you enter into the land, this is what I want you to do, rest. You know, like, okay, so we get in the land, we rest, you know, and now we're out of the land, we don't rest. You enter into His grace because the rest that you're being given will be a thousand years. It'll take care of all your Shabbats. <laughs> Trust me, you got lots of resting coming. <laughs> Wait, you think they would know? So, whoso offereth praise glorifies me, and to him that orders his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. I will praise the name of God with a song, and will magnify Him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock that has horns and hooves. In other words, it is... I start to say it's better to please God than to please man, but it was like the sacrifice... The sacrifices of God are broken in contrite spirit. And... 
and he will not despise. I can't think of the rest of the scripture. Wow, that's amazing. It's funny that that went that way. But the point was that I was trying to say was that in sack, in bullocks, and bullocks, <laughs> and ox, of all things, in ox and bullocks, it wasn't so much that he wanted a sacrifice, because to obey is better than sacrifice. You are better off obeying what God tells you to do than reading about the sacrifices of God and trying to make your life a sacrifice to Him by what you say you're going to do or what you think religion will tell you to do without involving Him telling you what to do. Because obedience trusts in the person it's obeying by the last command that was given or the last statement that was shared with Him. In other words, if God doesn't tell you to do it, don't do it. And if you don't know what to do, do nothing. Because you see, everyone wants to get up and do something. They want to run out there and accomplish something. They say, well, I got an idea, so they go out and do it. Instead of, I got an idea, I think I'll pray about it. Now, I pray about a lot of things. God starts me on something, and then God says, as I'm on my way, yes, I want you to be inspired this way, but now here's how I want you to use that inspiration. Now that I've got your attention, I'm going, oh, okay, so then I kind of get steered around once I'm on the way. But if I'm just sitting there on my hands doing nothing, then sometimes I'm waiting on the Lord to inspire me. Because you see, if you don't get told what to do, you shouldn't do it. Period. The reason being is that, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If your body, your physical being, right now, in this place, in this time, is presented to God as a living sacrifice. That means you're willing to bind yourself to the altar, sit there and wait until God either slaughters you, impresses upon you, releases you, or tells you where to go, what to do, and what to say. Most of the people I meet have no clue about a God-directed life. They only have an idea about the direction that God wants them to go, and then they take the footsteps on their own, even though they're ordered of the Lord. They take the footsteps of their own and ignore them along the way. When in reality, God wants us to take every step with Him, every step of the way. Because in the cool of the day, God walked with Adam, and they had fellowship. When you have fellowship with someone and intimacy, you spend a lot of time together. Now, some people don't want to be around their wife. Some people want to be always around their wife. Some people don't want to be around their husband. Some people always want to be around their husband. But the person you love with your first love you were obsessed with that person that you couldn't stand being apart from him. And that's what God wants from you. Because Jesus would rather you spend time with him doing nothing than doing lots of things without him. So every day that you choose to live your life this way, offering yourself as a living sacrifice fully and acceptable unto God, except you hear from him, don't do what you think you ought to do. Do what he tells you to do today. Thank <laughs> you.